The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Avantios Investments Limited, ABN 20096259979, AFSL 2455331, AIL, and Colonial First State Investments Limited, ABN 980023483522, AFSL 232468, CFSIL, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm David Pritchard, Executive Director of RAP at Colonial First State and responsible for our new innovative platform, CFS Edge. As technology progresses at rapid pace, the effective adoption of it has the potential to be a real game changer for practices, and undoubtedly it's going to play an increasingly important role in advice going forward. In this series, we uncover how technology can be used to drive competitive advantage, reimagine your client value proposition, and support continuous improvement. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for today's podcast. My name is Jackie Clark, I'm here representing CFS and I'm excited to be joined by Sue Viscovich, who is our General Manager of Consulting at VBP and probably really well known to many of you in the audience. 20-something years, I think it is, Sue. 20-something. Hi, Uh, Jackie. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Consulting, doing a lot of work with financial advisors. And today we are talking about how we can help build high-performance advice businesses off the back of some really exciting research that CFS partnered with you I think we spoke, was it later last year? Yeah, uh, we started sort of, this conversation in 23. Yeah. yeah, and you came to CFS with this really exciting proposition around we know that the operations function in an advice business is absolutely critical. No, no question no about doubt. that. Everyone knows that. But how do we actually value that? How do we put some quantitative measures behind that to help and advice practice really understand how operations functions can turn the dial in terms of profitability. I think that was the pitch you gave me. I think it was, yeah. Yeah, my colleague and I, Lana Clark, um, have been fascinated by this for so many years because we come in and we, we coach advisory firms and we help them look at the results they get. But there's never been any research on that critical engine room, the back office and of an advisory firm. And so we've gathered a whole bunch of data anecdotally over the years. We know what works. We see what sort of measures we can pull. Um, but to be able to pull together a really comprehensive set of data, both from researching practice principles but also the people that work in those back offices, we were so thrilled that you uh, that you saw the vision and that you were happy to come on board with us and, and sponsor it. Uh, and we're very happy to partner because I think it's really important. And the insights that have come from this yeah. have been amazing. Yes. So today we're going to cover off a little bit about the report. We're going to pull out some of those key findings and particularly talk about those findings that have been really well received in market. Mm-hmm. Importantly, also covering off some actionable insights. So I really hope, well, actually I know people will walk away from this podcast today thinking, yeah, that's something I can take away and put into my business. Yes. I can make some change straight away. And there's often simple things that uh, you uncovered as well. Yeah. And some of it, I think what what we love about doing these kind of conversations is because there's data, there's the information that we gather through this research, but then how do we turn that actually into those insights and the practical things that people can physically change within their their business rather than just hearing about something and thinking, oh, that's interesting. So yeah, I'm excited to get stuck in with you, Jack. All right. Tell us a little bit about the research, the actual report, how many advisors, all those sorts of details. Sure. Well, so we ended up with 171 advisory firms that participated in the research. And for us, when we went to market, it was really important to us that we had a really good cross-section across the whole profession. So it wasn't just Elixir clients. We really wanted to get that objective inside of what's happening in firms who may or may not have actually participated in any consultation 
consulting or or had any operations support. Um, so we got this really great group of businesses. The uh, the total number of advisors that were represented, we we had both advisors and risk specialists and mortgage brokers and accountants. So across those 171 firms, we had 561 financial advisors. There were 43 risk specialists, and we know there's not that many of them left in the mm. profession. So it was great to get a good decent size of those. And a lot of these firms were multidisciplinary firms. So we had about 72 accountants and 25 mortgage brokers were in there. Um, really good cross-section represented across the country. Um, my hometown of WA, we had 16% there, um, 21% Queensland, 29% New South Wales, 22% Vic, um, 10% in SA, and then one from ACT and one from um, Tasmania. We didn't get anybody from the Northern Territory this time, but I think that's pretty well representative of the advice profession across the board. And I think what's important too is that we had a good cross-section of um, – uh, those that were in uh, self-licensed businesses as well as with larger licensees. So I think the stats there, we had 37% of them were self-licensed um, and then you had 26% from medium-sized licensees, 27% from large and 11% from small. So a really good smashering across the whole profession in terms of the way that firms uh, are licensed and run their business. And in terms of even the size of businesses with a number of advisors, uh, they we had 31% had only one advisor in the business. Um, and that went all the way around up to, I think there were 8% that had five to 10 advisors, 4% with 11 or more. So it was a really good broad mix of different types of businesses, which was really important to us to have that that rich data. And I think for people listening today, that's also important because we know we're going to have a lot of small one-man or one-woman bands. Yes, that's correct. Uh, right through to those larger practices. So the insights yeah. we're going to share will help everyone. Yes, that's right. And we do know, I mean, I hate listening to research where people say, oh, you know, X percent of people are doing this. Like, well, that's fine if you've got 25 staff and you've got, you know, a massive uh, P&L that you can leverage from. Uh, where it's relative to the size of the business, we draw it out. Um, but there, it, it actually surprised us to some degree the number of times that we looked at the data and thought, oh, that might only be for X type of business. Um but it, it was actually quite standard across the board. So, yeah. Right. Well, let's let's get into it. I will say that we did talk about this uh, a couple of months ago uh, where we had the high-level findings. We mm. had a part of our CFS 10X program. We launched uh, the, the initial findings. Yeah. And what's exciting is you've just come out with the full report, which yes. is now available. And that's the, a lot of the insights we're going to share today. Yeah, absolutely. So we did distill down that secret source of, of a great back office. So there were those eight findings that we talked about on the webinar. Um, and there's an awful lot more data in the full, uh, in the full report that people can unpack. Awesome. Okay. So. Topic one, managing staff. Mm -hmm. What are some of the data points that you want to share with us soon? Well, I mean, this uh, it does make a lot of sense that people and culture is really important in an advisory business because you're not you don't have stock, you're not selling widgets. Everything that you deliver is delivered by humans for humans, right? So it's something that we do a lot of work in in our firms, and it was great to see that a lot of advisory firms have have recognized this and doing a lot of work around their people and culture. Um, and so when when we looked at this, we wanted to know you, you kind of basic things like, you know, did people have job descriptions and what about their training plans and all of those, I guess for want of a bit of a word, hygiene factors mm -hmm. for, for running good staff. Um, the things that often really small businesses struggle with because they kind of recruit on personality and then if there's a, only a small handful of people in the business, they don't worry so much about the rigor of a good HR model. Um, but what we did see, some of the really fascinating things that jumped out for us, particularly, I guess, from a, um, a, a strategic viewpoint of a business, one of the biggest ones I loved was the fact that we, we were talking about whether firms involve their staff in their strategic planning of a business. Because we know that businesses will succeed if they actually have a plan. Um, gosh, imagine that. Surprise, uh, surprise. Yeah. Uh, but actually putting that strategy together, we could see the difference between firms that just made decisions on the basis of the principal 
you're having a few thoughts and, and putting their ideas on paper versus those who actually involved their team. And so we did find that there were 49% of the participants involved their staff where appropriate in doing their strategic planning. Um, 25% only involved the owner. Um, and we did have some honest people in there. I think we had 5% of those said that they um, didn't do any strategic planning whatsoever. Um, but certainly of those that did, again, it makes sense, but we did find a very strong correlation that if if staff members were involved in the strategic direction of the business, they were far more engaged. They participated in the um in working better for the firm, in helping to execute some of those strategies, and particularly, I think, execute change, which is probably one of the most difficult things to to do within a business. Um, but if if the team members were involved in understanding why those changes were happening and they were involved in the strategy to create the change, then they had much more success in actually implementing it and, and feeling like they were really a, a valued member of the team to contribute. So I'm going to put my commercial hat on here yeah. and we're saying that those that are involving their staff more in the strategy are getting benefits in terms of productivity. Yes. Have we got a dollar number? Have we got a measure of yeah. that success? Yeah, well, we've got a percentage. So, And it's important, I think, here to have a bit of a baseline. So of those 171-odd firms, the average EBIT across all of the, the participants was 23%. Now, I want to qualify that, right? When we look at EBIT and profitability, we need to normalize it because small businesses, they pay themselves more or less or whatever they choose to, to have a right um, kind of tax structure for them. But when you're trying to get benchmarking data, you need to normalize it. And our view is, and in actual fact, we'll be increasing this over the next couple of years. But at the moment, we're saying uh, normalize principal salaries at 150K plus super. And that way you've got everybody on a level playing field and then you determine what the EBIT um, sure. values were after that. And look, I know that there are uh, various different sort of research studies around the place and they sit um, around that 23 to 28%. Um, I was speaking with the business health guys. I was chatting with uh, Ray the other day and uh, they actually normalised salaries at 100K because I was really worried going, but if our averages were 23% and you're getting 28, are we talking to different firms? 28% was after only 100K salaries being paid out. So is whatever the financial that, advisor going to work for 100K? Well, no, and we did have that conversation and they know that too. But I think because they've been doing benchmarking for so many years, uh, it was – too difficult to go and, and backdate that and change it. But sure. I think my point here is, is I guess is no the figures that underlie that benchmark. Don't think, oh, well, everybody else is, is doing more than me. Just understand the data that you're looking at. Sure. So if we think of that as that baseline figure, it was really interesting because we looked at those who involved their staff in their strategic planning and the average EBIT for those businesses was 25%. A little bit higher than the average across the board, but when you compare it to those who are doing strategy planning on their own and they don't involve their people, there's aver their average was twenty percent. So, quite a significant impact when you think of it. Oh, absolutely, and that's what we're trying to get to, right? The numbers. Yeah. So we're actually yeah. understanding that get your staff involved, which isn't really a cost. There's no, no cost in doing well, it. Well, there's a time and opportunity cost potentially sure. because they say, oh, everybody's going to have the down tools and we're going to do an offsite and, and we won't be doing client work. But I would actually then look at the flip side of that opportunity cost. If you're losing the opportunity to actually get your team involved, then then that's a greater opportunity that you're losing. And I love um, – there's a quote here from the research where um, I think this sums it up. Um, someone said, well, we built – threads and I was terrified that the client service team were going to say, no, we're not doing it. This is BS. But because they built it, they leaned into it and said, this thing's working. So again, it's part of that principle of change management. I think if you're involving your staff in those bigger picture decisions of the business, they feel valued and a part of it, but they're also the ones with their eyeballs on what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Even if you're a principal of a relatively small business, there's no way you know everything that happens with every client file. So get your key people involved to help you have visibility over that. Ask them what they want to see improved and where their bottlenecks are. They'll tell you. And then they'll be part of the solution to work out a better way around at things and then they'll be the ones implementing this new way of working. So, you know, in theory, it all makes perfect sense and now finally we have the data to be able to back it up. 
And something else that I think we, we know as an industry we're struggling with and advice practices are struggling with is retaining staff. Yes. And uh, I guess that research and involving your staff in the planning, mm. you also talk about satisfaction yeah. of staff. Yeah. Is that part of the, the retention piece as well? Look, Yes, it is. And, and you know, we, we hear about all these words bandied around like employee value proposition and people talking about it is more than money. Um, and it is. I mean, yes, people want to get paid well. Uh, and they, they certainly, you know, we were even asking business owners how they uh, address the remuneration for their staff. So do they just benchmark against the industry and look at like the Hayes salary guide or whatever? Uh, or do they link their salaries to performance of the business? You know, we, we, in our consulting life, we do a lot of work with firms to try to come up with what we call a performance enhancing remuneration model for their people. And a lot of people often talk about giving bonuses to the advisors. Um, and, and, you know, for those who are worried about it, you can still do it. Don't, you don't breach conflicted REM, um, rules if you have a good balance scorecard and it's part of their, um, uh, their whole package. But there were a lot of firms that actually con- um, created a, um, uh, 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 sorry, I'm just losing my words here, created an uplift in revenue for all team members. So everybody participated. If the business did really well, then everybody got a bonus. Uh, and so that did uh, make a difference financially. But then there were all these other elements that people said that helped them feel contributed, uh, help them feel valued in their role. Number one was acknowledgement and appreciation. Um, and I think, you know, we, you and I were talking about this before we turned um, the, the, the mics on, on, didn't we, the, where we were saying, you know, salaries are really important to people, particularly in uh, an environment that we're in at the moment where cost of living is increasing, but it's usually only an issue when they're not very happy in their role. Exactly. So uh, you don't wake up and say, I want $10,000 extra. You wake up and say, I'm a little bit dissatisfied or I'm a lot dissatisfied in my current role. Yeah. I'm going to start thinking about what what else is out there. And then I perhaps discover someone is prepared to offer me a little bit more. Um, I should say to my employer, I'm not looking to go anywhere. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think that's really key. So actually get those foundational pieces right, involve your staff, value them, value their input is a really strong message and it will drive profitability of your business. Absolutely right. Doesn't always. Uh, I actually was speaking to an advice practice recently and, and they were talking about I can't pay the receptionist 200k a year. And that's, that's right where we're at. Yeah. It, it's, we can't keep upping the ante. We have to look at other ways. Yeah. And it's, it is, um, you know, one of these measures that we, we hear people talk about around, you know, what are the, what are the ratios within a business? Um, and often, you know, if we're talking to private equity players and people that invest in advisory businesses, a lot of them are, aiming for businesses that are paying 45% or less out. So as a percentage of revenue, that's how much they're paying out to their team members. Um, and so, you know, if you look at the uh, commercial value of a team member, if you're not regularly benchmarking to market and you know, like, yes, salaries have gone up at the end, the bottom line is they have. Yeah. So if you have not been uh, implementing incremental salary increases over a period of time, you may well find that you are well out of the market. And nothing tells somebody they're more undervalued than being paid ten grand less than what their peers might be paid in another business. So you it is still important. I mean, you could value people, they could feel amazing and you could make them feel wonderful and involve them in strategy. But if they do then see if they get hit by a recruiter and they do see, well, actually you're taking advantage of me because I'm so far out of market, then that's definitely an issue as well. So it's part of the solution yes. in terms of retaining stuff, but not the, only, not the only one. That's right. And that's probably a really nice segue into something that I also found quite difficult in the past to actually quantify in terms of the, the importance, but culture. That was another yes. really key theme yes. that came out of the research. Okay, so culture, Sue, I imagine we're going to have a few listeners who are going to say, well, that, that would be nice if I had lots of time. It's a warm and fuzzy type of topic. Yeah. Interesting that you've done some research around it. Yeah. I'm looking forward to hearing the insights and, and how it's impacting on profitability of firms. Yes. But let's take a step back. And, and what does culture mean to you? Well, 
I think, Jack, culture kind of defines the behaviours and the values of a business. And, and it's often the things that you can't touch, but you can feel them. So it generally comes from uh, the beliefs and the values of the owners within a business, first of all. And then as businesses tend to grow, there's a bigger requirement to have a little bit more of a definition around what culture looks like. So it's certainly how people feel when they come to work. And now we actually have some definitive proof around the bottom line impact it has on firms. And and I think it's a it's a really interesting one because a lot of people think, oh, it's organizational culture. That's really big business and corporatized business like CFS. Okay, they're massive. They have to have a focus on culture, but it does also make a big difference to a small business. So um, there, there were two ways that we measured the success of different things within the research. One was around the EBIT. So, you know, what is the the profitability of the business? And sometimes that, well, often that doesn't tell their whole story because particularly in a smaller business, the, the business owners may have decided to reinvest that year and perhaps add a whole bunch more costs in the business because that's then going to let them scale up. So you don't, you never really want to look at that number in and of itself as in a singular measure. The other thing that we always looked at is the satisfaction. So we were asking um, business owners, how satisfied are they with the success that they're achieving in their business? Okay. Yep. And the culture score was fascinating. We asked people to rate the the culture in the business as a score out of five. And when we look, it's, it's actually, you can see in the chart, it's a direct line on both um, the EBIT and the satisfaction. So those who scored their culture five out of five, their average EBIT was 24.2% and their satisfaction score was 4.07 out of five. If you look at the bottom end where those who were scoring their culture three or below, their EBIT dropped to 19.6% on average and 2.8 uh, 2 out of five in terms of satisfaction. So Yes, it might be something that you can't put your finger on necessarily, but if you have a really good, strong culture and a positive culture in your business, it does make a huge difference. So satisfaction of the owners, EBIT, but also we know it has that other flow on effect of retaining great staff. And when you don't have high staff turnover, it means that you're not investing as much in trying to replace and retrain people. Uh, and the business can actually drive towards its strategic goals much faster and it's a whole lot more fun to, to be a part of. Oh, absolutely. You want to get up and enjoy where you're working yeah. each day and that's a huge part of the culture. Yeah. How do you influence culture? How can a small practice change culture or yeah. make a positive culture where people want to work? It's a great question, Jack. And I, it does depend on the business. So if you are in a really – if you're in a micro business, you know, if you've got four or five team members – Generally, the culture is defined by the personality of the principal, right? A, they don't have time to, to spend defining their culture, but it's just organic. Um, and so if you do have a really positive person, that's a really great person to be around and, and looks after their people. You're going to have a really good culture by default. Um, if and you've you, got, sorry, sir, so yeah, you, you said before too, it's deliberate in terms of your behaviors. So what you put out, you get back, I guess, Absolutely. as well. Yeah. And, and look, we do observe in a lot of really small businesses, it's just, the person. They don't intentionally get up in the morning and go, I'm going to be really nice to my staff today. It's just, it is just their natural personality. Mm -hmm. um, but equally, we also see where you might have someone who is a different personality type uh, if they are very strong willed and if they have a really super high expectations of their staff and they don't. Uh, they don't give any leeway around what might be happening in people's personal life or any any contribution of ideas then they may consider that there's going to be a really high-performing team because they have high expectations and, and everybody must live to those standards. In actual fact, we quite often see that they they don't necessarily keep hold of people um, because it is too much high pressure and, and they leave. So I definitely think there is a little bit of an impact in the size of the business. As you start getting more and more people, there's a, there's a bigger requirement to actually define the culture. And, and what I mean by that is, that is the first part is around defining your company values or your guiding principles. Um, and we actually, uh, we've got quite a few articles on this. So if anybody needs any help with that, there's, there's heaps Great. of stuff we can provide. But when we're talking about values like this, if, if it's straight out of a textbook, often we see advisory firms say, well, our values are integrity and trust and so forth. And they're 
they tend to be quite bland words that, yes, one would expect that of an advisory business. But where we see people do this really well is that the principals will get their heads together and really go through a process to articulate, well, what what are the values that we want to be known by? What are the guiding principles that for any team member, if they've got a decision to make or, or if they're welcoming somebody else into the team, we can define these are the things that are really important to us. And it might be things like, um, you know, we have fun in our workplace or we make sure everybody feels important. Yeah, and I think some of the research or, or some of the verbatim that came back from the research was saying, yes, it's great to have these values and, and as the larger the business becomes, we articulate that. Yeah. But then actually delivering it as well. It's one yes. thing to say it, it's another thing to actually oh, implement yeah. it. Yeah, we've all seen those firms that have got these lovely list of values and they might even be up on the wall, but they never actually do anything with them. Um, so creating that definition of them is important. And in fact, what we love to see is where it might be the principles have the foundations and, and we kind of talk in terms that they create the value seeds. It's, I mean, they own the business, right? So they're the ones to say, well, this is what is most important to us. But then they get their team involved in actually fleshing out those values. And and it can be great kind of off-site sessions where people are actually unpacking it and going, well, what does this actually mean to me? And let's come up with some examples of when we've seen this play out really well for our clients and where we've demonstrated that we're living these values um, but then also put it into some documentation and you create it as part of your um, recruitment process. Uh, so the number of times we've spoken to people who have said, I joined that business because they showed me their guiding principles and that is exactly how I, I want to live and that's how that's the kind of team that I want to be a part of because where I've come from, they used to do this, 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 this and this. So the fact that a firm can articulate it and say this is what we stand for but it also then gives you something to tangible to use when you're um, training and managing your staff. Mm-hmm. So perhaps one of the most exciting but also difficult parts of any advisory business is people, right? So what we encourage people to do is make those values a part of people's balance scorecards and their job descriptions. So your KPI is not just see this many clients or turn around advice documents within X number of days. But it is also live and breathe our values and demonstrate them in the daily work that you do. And so when people are going through um, what we might traditionally call performance management, if you've got a team member that's just creating problems in the workplace, um, it's, it's easier if they've done something physically wrong. Right. If they've made a mistake on a client file or not returned a call or, or, you know, physically done something to a client file that's not appropriate, then that's easy to call people on. But if it's their vibe, if it's the way they're treating other people, if it's their, you know, oh, they're, they're kind of lazy and they come in late and they never apologize, those sorts of things are harder to manage unless you've actually got these documented guiding principles that you can then have a really, straightforward conversation to say, well, Jack, we all agreed that the guiding principles that we live by are about trust and respect of one another. You're actually not respecting your teammates by turning up 15 minutes late because everybody else is picking up. We Can you see how that works? Language there that we're talking. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But but without that framework, it's very difficult to have those conversations. Um, And then you do see how that permeates through the rest of the organization if you if you give people those guardrails within which to play then the other elements around culture kind of come to play too you know do we have drinks on a friday afternoon or maybe we've got team members that don't like to drink so therefore we respect that too and we have morning tea on birthdays or you know some of those um less tangible things but still make the place a really lovely place to come every day. I want to work there, Sue. Yeah. <laughs> so so you're telling me that culture is driving profitability? Yes. How can I actually measure? How do you measure culture? How do I know if it's improving or getting worse? You said there's a direct correlation. So yeah. How do you do that? Yeah, look, I think I think most people will tell you, oh, they feel feel it. You know, it doesn't feel like we're happy, but that that's always um, through their own lens. And typically, if I've got a business owner that's really stressed and worried and frazzled, they're going to say their culture's not great, but that's not always represented in what's actually happening in the team and vice versa. It can go the other way too. So um, actually doing staff surveys is a really effective way of keeping your finger on the pulse about how people feel. 
Um, and how do you look, do that? Is it as simple as doing a survey yeah, monkey, a Microsoft form, yeah, yeah, something like that? There's a couple of different ways that firms can do it. I mean, there are some um, software providers and some some um, providers that you can actually engage and you can pay them and you can have a, a structured um, survey. Usually we find it's the larger businesses that might participate sure. in that, but there's nothing to say. And, and again, like for our clients, we've got a, a summary of questions that people generally select from and then they they – ask often the same questions each year because then they can keep an eye on how, you know, what the changes might be from one to the next. But thinking of it as a way that you can actually quantify and measure um, what that number is. Uh, And it's also got to be looking at things like, you know, gathering feedback um, from people, you know, in the old olden days, people would have a little box and you would put your, you know, your <laughs> feedback suggestions in the good old days before text. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, but but now, you know, the the questions and usually we find the questions that are put in those culture surveys are representative of what the business owners see as being important to them. So those that are really mindful of taking care of their staff and and they know that they'll get a better return on their business if they invest and put a good return get a good return out of their people they'll be asking things like um you know how valued do you feel in your role uh and you know how how well do you feel we live all of our company values and and often people actually document them one at a time you know one of our values is you know being trustworthy how well do you think we're living that value and so it's in the way that the questions are crafted, so they're not um, it, it, they're they're not um, what's the word I'm looking for? They're not so direct that people feel like, oh, I couldn't answer that on my behalf. It's how well do you feel we are doing X Y Z? And so people tend to feel a little bit more um, relaxed about contributing to those kind of questions as opposed to you know what do you think of of sure. this. I guess a, a anonymity is important for yes. larger firms. If you've only got one or two staff yeah, it's members, pretty hard it's, to hide. Um, so h- how could you do that? Uh, look, I mean, if you if you've got a really small team, it's near on impossible, right? Um, Unless maybe you go external. Well, yeah, but even then, it's often you know people know if I'm going to say this, who's going to know exactly who it's coming sure. from? But but I think even in those small teams, you want to be able to have the kind of culture that people feel comfortable that they can raise an issue. Um, and, and it does require some maturity of the business owner to be happy to hear negative things um, because if you don't know about it, you can't do anything to change it. Um, but certainly as you get a larger firm uh, and you've got more people on on the team, it, it's it, I would actually love to see if there are any studies on this to say is it the fact that the larger the team, the more blunt people are in the feedback they give because they think they're more protected by their anonymity. I don't really know. I'm sure there's studies on that. Um, but giving people the ability to create some numbers, so actually score things out of five or out of ten or whatever, you can extrapolate that out to a, 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 a culture score, but also getting that um, qualitative feedback as well. Um, and the, the you know those contributions of ideas, what could we do better, you know, what would you like to see with the team over the next six months or 12 months. Uh, I think I shared with you before, Sue, as well, one of the mid-sized practices actually use an external consultant to do some surveys. Mm. And um, probably a nice way to finish this particular topic on, they, they thought they were going to get back feedback around, we want more money, we want yeah. higher salaries. It was They wanted Tim Tams in the lunchroom. So <laughs> there you go. And sometimes it's a really simple thing. It can be the, the small things. things. Yeah. yeah, you're right. The big things are still important. So yeah. just to wrap this up, Culture is really key. Make sure you've got uh, staff involved, uh, and and you're you're living the culture. Yes. You're not just saying this is what I want. You're actually demonstrating that. Yeah, and it can drive profitability. There, look, there's uh, just two more points that I would sure. make on that, Jack. Before we move on, one is usually the only time we have real problems within a firm that can't be fixed. You know that saying, the fish rots from the head down. Sometimes the culture is actually permeated from the principals or people in senior management, um, and they set the standard for the rest of the organisation. So, uh, you know, great business owners are open to feedback. Sometimes they can't take it from their staff. They might take it from us as an external consultant, but being able to hold the mirror up and see where they personally might be influencing the culture is is really important to to have really considerable business success. The other thing too, though, is if you are using an external consultant, because we do these culture surveys for a, a lot of our clients, 
is it's it's to be very clear with the team if it is going to be a confidential survey or not. Because if it is, then people need to be really comfortable. And so then if the staff, if the owner then says, oh, hang on, who said that? I really need to know. I was like, we're really strong. We say, no, no, no you, you agreed. And we told your staff this was going to be confidential. So I'm sorry, you, you, you're not going to have that data. Um, but sometimes it is actually more helpful for them to say, look, we're going to do this by team so that we at least get a sense if there really is a problem, we can narrow it down to see where we might need to put some focus. Um, and in that situation, that's where sometimes people have been able to recognize, actually, I've got a workplace bully or I've got I actually had a business that had a workplace sociopath that was very good at covering up their behavior with senior management. And it was only when they drilled down into the actual team feedback that they recognized what was really going on. So there are pros and cons to the entire confidentiality piece. Um, but I think it's all around making people feel safe that they, you do want to hear them. They can contribute, you know, their thoughts and, and you're actually going to do something with the feedback that you get back as well. Not just, wow, look at us. We got a score of four out of five. Actually, yeah. hear them. Im- important to be heard. I now have an image of a rotting fish from the head down. But uh, <laughs> what, what a great way to finish it. Yeah, topic sorry about that. Culture. Let's just move on to something nicer. <laughs> great. So, really important part of the research. A highly sexy topic. Everyone's going to be very excited I'm about. Go on with this. Processes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Really important from the perspective of operations staff. They are doing the grunt work. They are the ones implementing. They are the ones who are following, I guess, a documented process, we're hoping. Mm. And this ultimately is going to hope to lead to efficiency. It's it's something we yeah. know an advice business can sharpen up. It yeah. should lead to profitability. Tell us a little bit about the data. What did you see when you did the research? Well, this this was one that we um we we shake our heads with. I mean, and look, you know, as you say, we know processes are not sexy, uh, but we're talking about uh, highly risky work that we do, and when people get it wrong, it costs the business money. So if you're investing somebody's funds and you don't follow the correct process and you do it the wrong way. Uh, not only could you be in refund territory for the client if you get it wrong, but you could be um, uh, putting them at greater risks around cyber attacks uh, and managing data. So we know it's a really important thing that people should do, but the research revealed that not as many people do it as as what we would like to think. So one of the one of the stats that we found were really interesting is is we asked the question just entirely across the whole business, whatever you're doing. What would be your biggest frustration in your business? 32% of them said it was something to do around their processes. Either they were out of date, they weren't documented, they weren't followed, um, or they were inconsistently followed. And we kind of really went down this rabbit hole around this. And and my colleague Lana, who who wrote most of this research and she did a lot of these interviews with firms, um, was actually looking at what is it that that how do people uh, construct their processes? How many people do actually document their process in the first place. And sad to say, across the 171 firms, only 35% of them had documented all of their processes. But it would be a few, right? I mean, we are a highly regulated industry. Yeah. You could spend a lot of your working year documenting processes that change on a regular basis. Yeah. So where do you key, find the balance? Well, it's a, it is a great point because it's they do change all the time. Um, and especially, you know, you are dealing with different product providers and rap platforms and, and so forth and they change their processes. So therefore the way that the firm um, deals with client information has to change. Um, so it should – so let me talk about what should and what can happen as best practice if you like and then we'll come back to the data – when we work on these things with firms, where the one thing is around the culture of we do it one way, same way. So we're not just relying on what's in Jackie's head or Mary's head or Joseph's head because they just they're really good at their jobs because that is far too risky in a business because if something happened to those people, all of that information is gone. But especially as you grow bigger and bigger and you're dealing with more clients and you've got more team members, you do need to have some level of documentation of process. So um, as much as it can be, you know, most advisors would rather eat their foot than sit down and write a documented process, let's face it. Uh, it can be uh, just laborious to actually get it documented in the first place. Although in saying that, there are some really good uh, tech tools now that are available to make that process a lot easier and quicker to document. 
But then embedding this culture of we do things a certain way, we train all of our team members how to do it. They don't have to pick up the document and follow it every day because they learn how to do it. But everybody also has this continuous improvement mindset. So as a product provider changes their process or as we discover a new piece of technology or a new tool we can use, then we tweak our process, we improve them, and it becomes this dynamic living document. So It might be if you've never done it, it might be a big job to get it documented in the first place, but then having a regular cadence of of everybody looking back and going, well, where are our bottlenecks now? What's what's the biggest problem in our workflow processes? Where are we getting the most errors? They're the things that we should get people's attention on and improve and tweak. And it's only when we do that that we can then actually start to leverage technology. We can start talking about automating some of our processes and really tightening up that security around them. I said we would come back to the data. When we looked at that profitability score, those who had documented their processes, they were averaging 24.8% EBIT and 3.8 out of 5 as their satisfaction score. If you compared to that to those who had no processes, 19.5% EBIT and 3.44. So it is definitely another one of those measures that has a direct impact on the bottom line. Yeah, and and I think with tech, you you just raised that before. That's the opportunity to really increase perhaps those EBIT numbers even higher. Look for yeah. greater efficiency through processes. We know on platforms now we're seeing that sort of innovation to improve processes. Um, a great example. CFS, we'd get phone calls into our contact center where staff are literally waiting to to find out where we're at with certain parts of the work. Oh. That's part of the you know tiresome, yeah, tedious type of phone calls. Uh, I think an average phone call to CFS is taking five minutes, not in terms of waiting, but actually just getting the information. Whereas that's all being automated now. You, yeah. You've got click to chat. Uh, the workflow tracker tools to actually speed those sorts of things up. Yeah. So processes, I, th- I think if you've got the right platform, you're getting that automation coming through. Yes. Um, and it is going to help with the, the, that tedious task of documenting those processes. Mm. Use the platforms that are providing those, mm. those tools. Well, it, it must frustrate you guys so much that you have, you've got these incredible tools and technological advances for people. And then you've got people ringing up in a firm going, can you tell me about X, Y, Z? You've built it for them. It's all there. It's one click away exactly. and nobody's trained them how to actually tap into these advances. Happy to take their calls, but it's about being efficient and helping the advice practice actually uh, manage their time better. Yes. It's a limited resource. Yeah. Um, and things even like integration, I guess, as well. So uh, we've done some work certainly on our first choice platform mm-hmm. uh, where we've got um, Elementor that we're using there and, of course, Edge as well where we've got the two-way data feeds, which is a huge time saving. Yeah. And those sorts of processes are going to drive efficiencies. They so- absolutely are, but they won't achieve the efficiency that they're built for unless the firm actually takes this seriously. Like we can't just say anymore, oh, process is really boring. We just rely on, you know, personality. Like exactly. there are good developments in in tech that help people deliver a better outcome. And I think your message there as well is it's one thing to have the process originally established, but it has to be followed. Yes, has, has to be to followed be and that it has to be kept updated and stay dynamic. You know, one of the pieces of, of one of the findings that just blew Lana and I away, um, I mean, it's again, it's not surprising, but to see it in, in black and white, anecdotally, you would expect that the quicker you can turn around a piece of advice for a client, the better outcome you can deliver, right? From a client experience perspective, you know, if a client's coming to you, they've got an issue, it's an issue now. Like they don't care that you need to do a complete fact find and then get an FDS and then a blah, blah, blah. Like they have a problem and they want you to solve it now. So we did look at the turnaround time of of getting advice completed. Um, and because we you know, of course, too, if, if you've taken the information from a client and it's taken you longer than 30 days to put that together, your information's out of date. You've got to go back and update your fact find before it's going to be um, relevant advice. That's, so, that would be actually 30 days would be at the the pretty fast end. Oh, yeah, sadly. Sadly, if if you haven't actually acted on it. Well, 
We actually, it's it's within the research. We ask this question of how long does it typically take a new client to get from initial inquiry to advice provided, accepted and implemented? This is when insurance is not required. That completely blows it out. Um, but there were some that sat within that one to three week time period. So on average, that was taking them 8.5 days to gather the information for the advice prep or the SOA prep. And then the average turnaround time of 4.75 days in power planning. So the firms that were able to deliver at that level, and some people would say to me, oh, Sue, that was, must have been single scope. That must have been really, really basic advice. But no, there are some firms that are nailing this and they've got their processes um, really down pat. The average EBIT for those firms that could turn around advice in under three weeks was 29.2 and they were a satisfaction score of 4.2. When you look at the table, we then go to, well, those that are three to five weeks, those that are six to eight weeks, those that are taking longer than eight weeks to turn that advice around, their average EBIT, if it was longer than eight weeks, the average EBIT was 22 and their satisfaction score was 3.3 out of five. So it's it's not surprising. It kind of makes sense when you think of it logically, but it's absolutely provable. If you can turn around your advice quicker, your business is more profitable, you're more successful arguably what's missing out of that is then the satisfaction scores of your clients. You're going to have happier clients. They're then going to refer more people to you. You can grow. You can turn around advice, get it out the door. And people have a much better sense of satisfaction for the work that they do, right? Because nobody came into this business to just muck around with some paperwork and, you know. So so what what we're we're saying is those firms that are slick and getting it done quicker are using the technology, using their platforms with that cutting edge technology that is supporting uh, a much slicker, faster process. The more efficient provision of advice. Yeah. Yeah. And they're seeing it in the numbers. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So the last area I really want to do a bit of a deep dive with you today, and it's probably not traditionally linked to the operations function as such, but it's around the investment approach that businesses have traditionally used in the past and where they're moving to. And and I'm just going to call it managed accounts. Mm. You did do some research around this. We did. Tell us a little bit about those findings. Yeah, look, it really, really did jump out at us. Um, And and I'll actually, I might challenge you on the thought that investment philosophy doesn't always fit into that back office process or thought process. We do often talk about it in terms of part of the client value proposition, right? You know, and, and advisors, I think, There's a lot more maturity happening in advisory firms now where they're recognizing, you know, they might not be the smartest person in the room to pick the stocks and and so forth. If they're an advisor, their best use of their time is spending time with clients with that strategic decision making and the goal setting, all that sort of stuff. Um, So let's get an expert to do that investment management. But equally, how we structure that and how we access those investments is really important. And so having a a robust investment philosophy for the firm that is not just the opinion of the individual advisor that anyone might see, you know, we see that as being really important. But then drilling down to the actual functionality of it and how people uh, execute on those investment philosophies we do find that managed accounts had a really significant impact. So there were just over half um, of the participants are now using managed accounts in in their businesses. Um, And we saw a huge amount of time saved. So if we split it up between advisors and support staff, and we put sort of power planning and and admin support in that bucket, and it was fascinating that of those who used uh, managed accounts, 85% of the advisors saved up to 15 hours a week in a week. administrative time. A week, you think about that, yeah. extrapolated. And then 62% of support staff saved up to 15 hours every week as well. Like just just for a moment, just even thinking about the, the better work that people can be using. We talk about this concept of having every team member doing their highest and best work. Um, you know, if they're not doing administrative stuff, they're not creating ROAs every time they, uh, you know, uh, affect a change in a portfolio. That is really significant. And it definitely had a direct impact on EBIT. Um, so those who were using uh, managed accounts, their average EBIT was 27.8% with a satisfaction score of 3.8 out of 5. So again, it was very tangible. And we then also asked, well, what were they doing with the extra time that they had left over? Um, if they weren't doing all of this document, if there's this paperwork and administrative stuff, and the large percentage of them were spending more time with their clients, whether that be bringing on new clients, having better conversations, being able to fit in more client reviews and therefore able to serve more clients per advisor. 
it was really very tangible. Wow. I mean, that's a huge amount of time. Uh, I've, I've done some work recently on sale of businesses as mm. well, and I think there's a huge risk uh, in in terms of if you're going to sell out of a business and the investment philosophy is really just around you. Mm. How, how does that transcribe? How does that move forward to the new business yeah. owner, whereas um, a managed account provides that consistency yeah. as well? Yeah. So it's time saved, but it's also a, a business philosophy that will be be uh, perpetual. It can continue. Yeah, and on. it will have an impact on the value of your business. Yes, because if you have sold your clients on the fact that you are very clever at picking their investments, uh, that may mean that they are at higher risk of leaving if you are not the person making those decisions. But you know, I think most people nowadays are pretty cognizant of the fact that this is actually quite complex and. Personally, I mean, I know I know a lot more about financial services than the average person, but I would much prefer someone saying to me as a client that, you know, I'm going to get access to some of the best investment minds in the country and it's going to be delivered in such a way that's really effective and efficient and, you know, we can make uh, decisions and impact the, or, or um, uh, um, ex- execute on those decisions quickly. I would far prefer that than somebody saying, I'm really clever at picking stocks and, you know, I'm going to make you lots of money. Um, I think we have a trust factor there too. I think it's also important to recognise that that advisors do have a huge part to play, obviously. Mm -hmm. Investment has been the sort of the the foundational part of advice. And I think platforms, I certainly know at CFS, it's something that we've been very cognizant about in terms of evolving the managed accounts offer. Yes. So what we would have seen two or three years ago is very different oh, yeah. to what's around today. Yeah. Uh, there's so many different sort of SMAs, managed accounts that are, are available. I know we've just launched uh, uh, managed accounts that you know now are in 11 different currencies mm. uh, with that international flavour in there as well. You've got zero-based fee type of uh, managed accounts that now uh, sit across, at, certainly I know, across our platforms as well. Yeah. So that offer has definitely evolved in response to what advisors are looking for. So yes. this. You can almost, you've got a selection that mm. you can go and find, well, which one works for my clients or, or yeah. this particular segment that I'm working with. Yeah, so and, and to, I, I would actually make a, a big call, a big sweeping call, which I very rarely do, but I think it is going to be incredibly difficult to scale a business if you are wanting to get beyond your 80 clients per advisor or even your one or two advisor firm, if you're wanting to achieve scale and and really build a significant business, it is going to be very difficult to do that without the use of really clever tools like like managed accounts. So uh, if we just sum this one up, managed accounts or the investment portfolios that an advice business actually introduces is going to be really significant in terms of driving efficiency. It's freeing up time. And we're talking significant amounts of time here, not Mm. just an hour here or there. Correct. So both the advisor, but also the support staff, the operations function behind and direct correlation to profitability of that business. And what is really important about that is then considering what are you going to do with that freed up time? Mm. Bring on more clients because we know that's another key driver as well. Exactly. Uh, But make sure you pick the platform. No no terrible plugs here. but (laughs) That was a very subtle. Yeah, it was a bit subtle, wasn't it? But the... Pick the platform that's going to give you that depth of offer. So it's not just one managed account. There's a selection to fit your clientele. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Sue, we have uh, probably gone way over time. No doubt. uh, We've only really just scratched the surface in terms of the research and findings. I started off by saying that the full research report is now available. Mm-hmm. Uh, you certainly can come to the CFS website to get it because we're very yeah. proud sponsors of this research. Very we excited to have partnered with you. I have no doubt uh, your customers, your yeah, clients, you that can you get it from work. the Elixir website as from well. Elixir yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, or certainly I know you can talk to your CFS BDM. Yeah. They'll happily uh, talk to you and provide this information as well. Yeah. It's been an absolute privilege talking to you today and really – I, I think some cutting edge research encourage those who have listened today to to uh, pull off the report and actually see 
the the different things, the simple things mm. that you can introduce into your business mm. that will make a difference yes. is going to help drive that profitability because that's what we're yeah twenty three percent. We we need the work that we do in this space. We need to be getting that higher. Yes, that is as an average. That is way too average for what advisors deserve to get. And you know the other thing that I love about so much that we found here is that it increases and and improves the value of what clients are uh, receiving from the services as well. So it's that beautiful trifecta of increasing the quality of the service provided to your people, uh, the happiness of the people within your business and and your people and culture and your staff. And your bottom line of how much money you're making. What's not to love about that? Amazing. Thriving advice businesses. Thank you, Sue Viscovich, for your time today. Thank you, Jackie Clark. It's been my pleasure. 